Uh, very happy this month to be introducing uh, Bob McCarthy. Now, Bob McCarthy is a legend in the sound industry. He's been working uh, for way over 30 years, mm. a lot of the time with Maya Sound. Now, Jimmy had the absolute pleasure of sitting down with him and picking his brain about what's changed in our industry, where technology's gone, and what's happened. I'm speaking with Bob McCarthy of Maya Sound. Bob, thanks for taking the time to have a talk with us. Well, thanks for having me. Now, you started first with Maya in 81, correct? Uh, as an employee in 83, but as a user um, of the products in 1980, January of 1980. Wow. How, how were the early days? Have you got some cool stories? Oh, they were very experimental. Um, and you know, the company was very, very young in those days, and uh, things moved very fast. And um, I think, uh, you know, Coming in uh, uh, one morning, Monday morning, and finding that John had removed the FFT analyzer that I used to do the bench testing off my bench, and there I was sitting, waiting, like, what am I going to do? And he came in and he said, well, we just did, I just was in Phoenix at, at the Rush concert, and I figured out how to analyze with the analyzer to measure the sound system with the band playing, I think this is going to be really awesome. This is the, the origins of the periscope, as you call That's, it? Yes, exactly. Well, it was the first day it was taken out and put into service tuning sound systems in the field, and that's where I've been with it ever since. Um, to tell us about the origins of the CP-10. Well, the CP-10, um, originally, uh, before I joined Meyer, I was... I had my own shop where I was doing custom electronics, repairing, repairing consoles and building little custom stuff that people would make. And a bass player had asked me to make a bass preamp with a parametric EQ in it. And so I had gone through my all my circuit books and these things and uh, built a done the done the boards you you go to radio shack and you buy these little stick-ons and you, you etch them and you <laughs> etch them on and uh the thing of course took too long it was uh and by dragged on and i ended up uh stopping my business and joining meyer sound while the thing was halfway done and then at the same time as john was out doing this thing with rush was the day it was like okay i'm going to etch the boards on my on my back porch, get that thing done. And so first thing John wanted when he, when we sat down and he were putting things back together on my bench and telling me about the Rush concert was, he says, we, we can't use graphic EQs. We gotta make a parametric and uh, here's a schematic. I want you to breadboard one up, but I hate this. It's a bad circuit. So I wanna, I wanna do a different one. And I said, well, I just made a parametric equalizer yes, when I yesterday, <laughs> exactly. And he said, well, let's let's build yours and see what happens. So I brought my boards in and we stuffed it there. And um, uh, the next day when it was got up and running, I had left and I was working on something in the next room and I heard John start yelling. It was like, oh my God, oh my God. And I thought, oh God, I'm in trouble. What did I do? And he's sitting and staring at the at the uh, response of the CP10 is going, it's symmetric, it's perfect, it's complementary, it does the phase like I wanted. I'm like, oh, okay. It's, I, I didn't know there was a, a wrong way. It was the, that was the circuits that we, that we knew, mm. but that was well, I didn't realize how it was not a common circuit at that time and it was exactly the right circuit to do the kind of sound system tuning that we were looking to do. And so it was an amazing sort of set of circumstances that set into motion uh, my involvement in the project for the next lifetime. That's where I'm at. And continuing. Exactly. What, what do you enjoy about what you do? What, what's uh, You do a lot of education, you, you've got a book, and what what's the most fun aspect of your work for you well I think the to me what's the most fun is that I get to I get to continue to learn and explore um, I get to 
I get to push the envelope and try if, to see if there's a better ways to do things because people keep throwing more and more interesting and complex challenges to me. It's, uh, what's happened, I think, is that sound designs have become more and more complex because the designers have the capability of taking more and more risk because we're able to get more and more control in their systems. You know, in the olden days, you, you, any sound designer always wants to sort of push the envelope but doesn't want to have the thing come crashing down on them. Mm. But as we get better and better tools, better GSP control, better, uh, better well-behaved speakers, all of these kind of things make it so that you can do more and more interesting designs. And I love a super, super complicated pile of spaghetti design. Like, for example, the Beatles uh, Cirque, du Soleil, Cirque du Soleil Love Show uh, with Jonathan Deans, who designed that. It's 6,600 6, speakers. It's a couple. Uh-huh. 288 <laughs> channels of processing, and it's just the, all of this intricate interrelationships. It was great fun to sit and sort that all out and get it all going, and then, of course, to get to hear Beatles music played through it, all the better. That can't be too bad either. Exactly. So you would have seen a lot of developments in things like DSP and, mm -hmm. and better phase coherent speakers and, mm -hmm. and you know, more efficient amplifiers, real-time analyzers, prediction software, better control. What do you think, what's been the, the biggest thing for you that you think has, has led to where we are now? What do you think's been the biggest sort of, oh, this all clicks now moment? Well, um, it's a series of things. Um, to me, improvements in in loudspeaker control, uh, in it's making speakers that can do can do their job uh, better without having all you know reducing the artifacts so that you know, so that you can when you find the right display angle or the right interaction between things that it really behaves for a large portion of the frequency response instead of uh, with poorly designed speakers and they were good designs at the time but mm. but what we now would look at and call inferior designs by current standards you would get part of the range to work well and other ranges had artifacts and things too much too much coverage not enough coverage gaps over overflows and we've we've gotten so much better uh, raw acoustical tools to work with the DSP advances are great um, but to me they're not as important as the as the transducer and the self-powered speakers which are really important because it reduces all the variables of all the things that are possibly wrong in, in systems. Uh, it means that you can spend much more time fine-tuning the, the display angles and, the, and these kind of things because the speakers all have predictable responses. I think the, it's the all of it, but to me I think a real key thing, a gigantically important thing, is that the attitude of the industry is so different now than when we started this quest. In 1984, when we started doing this, we were laughed at, and uh, one guy came to a job and, and brought a lab coat and put it on to me. And it's like, you got no business here with your stinking science. This is the real world. We're rough and tough, Mr. Sound. That's how we do it. We stack the boxes up. Exactly. We do it like this because we've uh, always done it. Exactly. And and the attitude was, we don't need no stinking analyzers. And the n nowadays, it's really wonderful to me that people understand and appreciate the value of an objective mind to help with the artistic pursuit. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, this is a, there's a big artistic part of this, but there's also the laws of physics and there's the science behind it. There's no taking away the fact that both of those things are constantly present. Mm. And so, uh, the the RM, the scientific side has greatly evolved, which I believe makes it 
much more possible for the great artists to really immerse themselves in, in what they do. And I love being a part of helping a great, uh, really artistically talented person immerse themselves in what they love to do and express and think of things that I would, breaking the rules and think of things that I wouldn't, wouldn't think of because they have this artistic sensitivity. But we have now the scientific tools to help them out and keep them from hitting walls that they don't see. Because mm. that's the beauty of the, the nature of sound is it, it can really surprise you because it's invisible and hard to predict what's going on. Yeah, I guess um, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And now that we do have all of these tools, uh, I mean, I'm sure you periodically see people get a little bogged down in, in uh, applying a specific tool or, or, or one particular aspect. What's the biggest mistake you see commonly in system design? The, the biggest mistakes that I see are in system design, I think the mistakes are... Um, getting too much too much coverage of too many areas it's sort of like hey hey uh, that speaker's already got that handled and you can you can kill yourself with density mm. um, but um, I think the in the system tuning side it's the 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 th the thought process that what you're doing as global implications when actually it may just be an event happening right there mm. and if you don't if you don't get your yourself and your mic and your things all around the room you really don't have it figured out yet because okay. what's happening right here is happening right here and if you want to know what's happening over there you got to go there and then you can start to extrapolate what's between those points mm. but until you've gone between a and b you don't know what's in between those two locations and i think that's one of the big things is we we everybody wants to and i don't blame them i want that myself but you want a nice clear and simple answer and really this is a real game of little gray victories little 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 things because it's still all these horrible looking fuzzy lines the traces look terrible on a great system the data looks terrible still we all have to get over that <laughs> that and i'm always you know have to get people to realize no yeah that's really good but we're looking at it in such high resolution and our ears are so good at our ears are amazing machines at finding the signal the music, the voice, amongst all this reflections in all these hostile environments. As bad as it looks on the screen, our brain is able to sort through that. And that's one thing that people don't quite realize is how much brain power is going on that they don't realize. And that it's complicated, but it's a learnable thing. So we don't have to start staging gigs inside anechoic chambers just yet. No, anechoic chambers are still not popular, and I think for good reason. Um, got a favourite band, Bob? I mean, obviously the, there's some passion in what you do. Oh yeah, I'm, I I still am a you know Jerry Garcia is still my musical centre. I'm that's still my favourite band, but. I love uh, Mark Knopfler and Dire Straits. I, I, uh, Pat Metheny is wonderful. Uh, Tuck Andrus of Tuck and Patty. Uh, there's a lot of great. I'm a guitar guy. It's kind of the guitar people are speak to me. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time. It's been lovely to have a chat. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks much.